September, right? Yeah. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> It's September 8th, 2009. And this is the third Idle Thumbs Penny Arcade Expo podcast. And I'm Chris Rima. I'm Nick Brecken. And I'm Jake Rodkin. And we're joined today by Mac Walters from uh, Bioware. That's right. Uh, lead writer on uh, Mass Effect 2. Great. Yeah. So uh, how did you get to be lead writer on this project? Were you were you the same role in Mass Effect or, or were you... Uh, or is this a, a new a new role for you? It's a new role for me. I, uh, Drew Carpation was the uh, okay, lead yeah. writer on. Uh, a lot of people know him from uh, mm-hmm. uh, some of his uh, Kotor stuff, and obviously working at Bioware for so many years. And uh, so he was lead writer. I was a senior writer on Mass Effect, and then I uh, killed Drew. And oh, wow. uh, now, well no. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, no, he uh, he actually chose to go down to Austin, and he's working uh-huh. in our Austin office right now. And uh, so I took over the the mantle of lead writer for Mass Effect too. How's that been? I mean, has, has it been sort of, does it feel like big shoes to fill or is it kind of a, are it's, you pretty familiar at this point having, having already been a senior writer? Yeah, it, it's very familiar. And, and the nice thing was I knew, you know, um, it was probably about a six month period that I knew Drew was going to be going. So I had lots of opportunity to ask all the questions and get invited to all the important meetings and things like that. Yeah. But it's also been a very busy experience. Mm-hmm. So there hasn't really been a lot of time to, you know, worry about, you know, how difficult it's going to be or what, uh, you know, just, it was really just get the job done, get the job done. And, and so far it's been great. Um, I've really enjoyed it and, uh, you know, chance to, to some degree, you know, put your own stamp on something. It's, it's really nice. Um, obviously, you know, I work with, you know, four or five other writers, so it's not just me, but, uh, um, there is some ownership there, which is really nice. Yeah. Yeah. Can you speak to any of the ways that, 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 you know, we might expect to see that versus Mass Effect? I mean, in terms of the, the style or tone or, or anything along those lines? Well, I can tell you some of the things that I was personally pushing for. Um, and obviously, um, uh, Preston, uh, uh, Tommy Ackert, lead, lead designer, and Casey Hudson agreed with it. It's just, um, we're, you know, the writing was, I think, uh, really good, Mass Effect 1. Uh, there's nothing wrong with it, but it, everything's BO'd now. And uh, we, I decided that, you know, I really wanted us to be able to have natural dialogues as much as possible. And one of the things we started doing was uh, just even just table reads with the writers, you know, sitting down, and we'd have our, uh, our uh, BO, BO director, Caroline Livingstone, there. And, you know, she could say, uh, you know, that line's going to be really hard to to say out loud as an actor, you know, so uh, a lot of it ends up, you're, you're just cutting stuff you don't need. Uh, it's reducing the length of the line, just getting the fluff out a lot of times. And, and, you know, as, as writers, we try to do that ourselves, read our own stuff out loud, but it's not until you hear somebody else say it out loud. You know, sometimes you're like, Oh yeah, man, maybe I should edit that down a little bit, make it a little bit more natural. Certainly in, you know, anything that's got any kind of intimacy or intensity and stuff like that, you really want to, um, you know, make sure that uh, you're just you're using the words as little, a few words as possible, mm-hmm. I find, in a lot of those situations, especially because we're so cinematic as well. Sometimes saying more is, is actually worse. Was that interrupt system that uh, was, was that born out of the desire to cut down on some of this book? Um, actually, the interrupt, interrupt system, if, <laughs> I hate to bring it up now, but uh, it was something that they had talked about doing, and I think it actually got released at some point in Mass Effect 1 where we said, yeah, we're going to be able to interrupt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. that's right. And it was one of the most, the things I was most excited about. I know. That game. And, it, and it never happened. I mean, you know, it was a, it was a first X, Xbox 360 game, first Unreal game. You know, there's, we couldn't do everything and some things, right. you know, didn't happen. And so, but it was something that we all felt really strongly about, still really want to push for. And uh, again, you know, we want to make small target improvements, you know, to the whole game, but, you know, everybody responsible for their system. And I think that was one that we really looked at for the conversation system, a way to make it feel more dynamic, make it feel like you, there's, there's more action in a conversation, um, you know, uh, than just words. So it just, it, it, it is, it's a lot of fun to, to play through it and just see some, I mean, people who've seen the E3 demo know, have seen, you know, one example of it sort of thing, but it, yeah, right. it's uh yeah, it's a lot of fun. I, and I think, yes, it does, it goes to go, does go towards what you're saying, which is, um, you know, just making everything feel a little bit more natural. And, and like, you know, when you can actually interrupt someone, I think of it more of an action system than an interrupt system, but you are, you are literally interrupting the, the flow of conversation when something happens. So, yeah. yeah. With the, uh, with respect to, to the dialogue and, and sort of the idea of, oh, there's someone who knows this line might not sound good when it's, when it's spoken by an actor. I mean, is that one of the things you think that lack of experience or familiarity is what, in many cases, limits voice acting in games because it does seem strange that as production values for games skyrocketed and I mean games look amazing now, it's voice acting is one area where it's still really sucky. it's still pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know how else to put it. But it's I think it's a com- I think it's a combination of things. I think one, um, you give any uh, creative person you know license to do what they do, write, create art, they will do that and they will do it. You know, sometimes 
too much. You know, if I'm a writer, I'll, I'll tend to write too much sort of thing. So you, you need to have a good internal sense of editing, which is something we always try to develop in the writers. Um, but for us, a lot of it is iteration, you know, we and, and peer reviews, having other people look at the work and give you critical feedback and then being able to take that. Um, but also, I mean, our, we have a very uh, strong um, VO department, you know, because, you know, the words um, were something that was always big at Bioware. We realized as soon as we started VOing it, and, and adding that, that we were going to need to have strong support there. So, um, you know, we're very careful about casting now, uh, much more so than in the past. You know, before it would just be, oh, yeah, you know, we've always had that person. Let's bring him back. But no, we're, if we hear something, it's just like, you know, that's cartoony, you know. We'll, and even if it's been recorded, we'll be like, nope, we record it, get it done again sort of thing. So it's having that, that level of standard, you know, where we're willing to say, no, that, that doesn't sound like something that should be in, in this game and, and going back and, you know, redoing it if necessary. Sure. Yeah. Uh, this is a really goofy question. <laughs> Who wrote the opening text crawl in the first Mass Effect? That's like my favorite thing. Oh, really? Ever. We were talking about it on our podcast like a couple weeks ago. Yeah, yeah that, that would have been, uh, Drew would have written that. Mm -hmm. And it probably would have been heavily iterated on by Casey uh, Hudson, okay. the, uh, yeah. the producer, especially uh, anything in the opening. He's 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 uh, got his, his eye right on it sort of thing. So, I mean, especially the first one. You can imagine like we're establishing sure. a brand new world right there, right? So, And now that is one of the things that's fallen on my shoulders for the uh, second one. So I hope you like it. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I, another, we've actually been coincidentally talking about Mass Effect a lot on this podcast. I've been replaying it recently, and uh, and one of the things is there is sort of a bit of a difference between the tone of that text crawl and some of these sort of like spacefaring kind of adventure tone of the game. Mm -hmm. Like the 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 opening text crawl sort of implies like it's you know the Mass Effect, this sort of unknowable, crazy, sort of advanced uh, thing. But in the game, you you can use it pretty easily, and you can travel to planets pretty quickly. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about sort of sci-fi writing in general and kind of how to to bring that tone into games and, and how to sort of take that weird, almost um, enigmatic type yeah. of sci-fi and, and bring that into games. And are you thinking about that at all in Mass Effect 2? And it's a very vague question. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, how do you keep it mysterious when you're designing like a 20-hour game that where people are zipping around? I mean, yeah, exactly. Um, I think, you know, the, the disparity, like you were talking about, you know, with the text crawl, the, the text crawl, had to kind of introduce a very new concept very quickly so that people got it. This is, this is how we do space travel. And this is, but it's, it's more than that. It's also how humanity got on the stage in, in our game. That's, that's how they joined the galactic community. But really once that was established, what you want, um, and maybe this is where some of the mystery disappears is that we, we did, we wouldn't want the rest of the species to treat it like it was something odd. Like they've been dealing, this is like, you know, this is like car travel for us. It's just like, eh, you know, yeah, we, we deal with that. Um, I'm personally a big fan of mystery. I love mystery in games. I, as long as it gets resolved at some point, you know, like I, I love not telling the whole story. I love, I love it is that uh, there's just enough there to keep pulling me along and drawing me into it. Um, and actually, I had another interviewer saying, "Don't, don't you find that the codex entries give away too much information?" I'm like, "Well, maybe they do, but that's why they're optional. Like, don't read them if if, <laughs> if you don't want to uh, sure. learn that, you know, in that much detail." But by the same token, it's such a huge universe. Um, that we're creating, you know, we can open up new areas anytime we want or allude to things and, and not really deal with them right away and then bring them up later on. So, I mean, and, and we also have, you know, Drew writing novels. I've got the comic now so we can explore other areas in there and just sort of, um, like if anybody remembers the, the, uh, bring down the sky module, we had, that's where we introduced the Batarians, but you would have read about them in the book first if you had seen that sort of thing. So it's an interesting way to sort of, oh yeah, Batarians, like who, what, you know, and then, you know, you get the DLC, oh, there they are. And, and, uh, you know, and then we can use them in future games as well, sort of thing. So, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, sure. so no, my vague yeah. answer to your yeah, vague question. How's that? Question. It's just kind of a topic of a yeah, okay. discussion, I guess. But yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess one of the benefits of working in that space where you have someone who is, because I, I haven't read the books or anything, but I, uh, but I mean, of just having someone who is doing that kind of work, um, I feel like that pays off in the game for someone who hasn't read that because you end up in a situation where. Uh, one of one of my favorite things about about Mass Effect, particularly the opening of Mass Effect, is that you have this character who is just you are part of this elaborate command structure within the military and part of this this sort of complex situation, and and everyone addresses you as if you you already know what's going on, and it, you, as a player you have to simply adopt that immediately, and and uh, I, I I imagine that is entirely born out of someone just having written all that stuff down like right off the bat just with before it was in the game. Yeah, just an issue. Well, I guess this guy's part of, of this organization, and this reports to this person, and here's this, and here's that. And yeah, I mean, backstories uh, and and world world development—that's a huge part of our process. Obviously, it's, I mean, 
every game, but Mass Effect One, sure. probably more so because we're we're creating the world from scratch at that point, right? So um, we there's reams of documentation, sort of listening at well, yeah, what is the command structure? What is, you know, and and fortunately we had. Uh, Writers on staff who just love that sort of thing. They love the minutia. And, uh, uh, I wasn't one of them, you know. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, it's not, I like to read about it, but to, to come up with it sure. can, it's, it's not, it's, it's not my strength, I'll say. Um, but they, they just went to, you know, like if, uh, another example is the, all the, uh, planet descriptions, you know, there's so many planets you can go to. And, and there's people who just love writing that stuff and it's accurate, you know, and it's interesting. And, um, but I think, I think, Go ahead. I was going to say, I mean, do you just prefer to just sort of play around with all that stuff once someone else makes it up? Or, I mean, is that, uh, I mean, that's I mean, maybe a stupid me, question. Yeah, for, you for me it. personally. Well, I mean, I've, I, certainly now as a lead writer, I'm responsible for anything that goes out. So yeah. I have to review it and, and make, yeah, sure, yeah. It, make sure it fits. But uh, for me, my, my personal thing is, yeah, I like to I like to go and explore those things and read them. And I love that they're there. Right. But actually getting to, like, um, yeah, I remember back on Jade Empire, I was doing uh, item descriptions. Right. You know, and, and I was just like, you know, it was fun at first. And then after a while, I was just like, wow, okay, how many different ways can I describe <laughs> yeah. a sword? Right. Um, that's interesting. How so many then, ways yeah. right now? <laughs> I think, Number. I, I think there was a, oh, boy, how many were there? There was, there was about three dozen, I think, sort of just in the sword category. And then there was a whole So yeah. there's 36 yeah. ways to describe a sword. <laughs> 36. <laughs> Confirmed. Confirmed. That's right. That's right. Out of thumbs, five guys exclusive. Yeah. I had some, I remember one of my favorite ones was I described this uh, staff and basically, uh, um, it got past nobody just complained about it, but it was like a, one of the main items. I'm digressing here, but I get to tell no, the no, story. So, but uh, basically, talked about how this guy had taken a uh, you know a, a, a small trunk and stuff like that, and basically polished it with silk for hundreds and hundreds of years until it was a finely honed thing. And it's just like, oh, that was kind of fun to do. But you yeah, know, yeah. there's only so many of those that you're gonna you know pull out of, pull <laughs> right, out of thin air. And after yeah, yeah. after a while, it's like uh, this is another sword forged, and it's great and it works well. And yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Also, once you get to the point where it's like every staff is. Is you know has been whittled right. down. Yeah. This yeah. world's yeah. amazing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's yeah. got sweatshops of guys. Right. With silk. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's actually well. Actually, you know, that's actually a really good point. Is that um, uh, just in writing in general? Um, is that if if everything is gold, then you know, like you, you, there's there's some things that you're then nothing is. Then nothing is right. It's like the, yeah, it's the uh, what is that? The incredible. You yeah. know, it's everyone special. Nobody's special. So I mean, <laughs> there are things that you're going to want to spend more time on and 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 devote more time to and and be more special because those are the things you want to pop out. And then the other things, you know, you, you're just like, well, we'll take those at face value and just put you them just in. Make so those like, good. Yeah, make them good. So that, you know, there is there is sometimes good enough. People might hate to hear that, but if you do it right, it's just that people don't even notice, right? You know, they they accept it. And that's it. So yeah, well, I, I mean, I do have to say about Mass Effect. I, I don't really know if the stuff I like about Mass Effect is the same stuff everyone else likes about Mass Effect, but but I I do get a huge. I mean, I think probably some of my favorite stuff in Mass Effect is really just particularly on the Citadel, just the goofy little side quests that you do for people. These weird little things that are that are not. They're not epic or anything, but it's like, well, this guy's got this weird problem to solve. But then you can solve it three different ways, or you can you can betray the guy, or you can help him out, or you can turn him into to his boss, or you know whatever these different things you can do. And it's I do find that really interesting. And there is sort of an art to that of sort of making the mundane interesting. Mm -hmm, yeah, and I, th I think uh, it's it's also a fine line because you have to, like you said, they, it, it isn't saving the galaxy. But at the same time, if you make it too silly or too mundane, right, then it feels out of character for Shepard to be doing it. So there is always that. That has to be that that sense of plausibility that yeah, as Shepard, I can see myself helping this person out and, and setting. And sometimes it's really just in the setup. You know, it's just done in such a way that the player feels like, oh, I actually discovered that, and that's my choice to do it. And I, I go ahead and do it. And if you, if you pull that off, it's great. I mean, we I'll, I'll be honest; those are some of the plots that we we scrutinize a lot of because you know a lot of times when we say it's like yeah, okay, that's you know all bets are off. We're not saving the galaxy. You come up with something creative and fun. And sometimes they go and they're too creative and too funny. You're just like, okay, no, you know, Shepard isn't going off and yeah. getting that cat out of that tree. You know, that, right. that doesn't <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Shepard style. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. just like, let's, let's not do that. Yeah. Um, but, uh, we've discovered a carnival world on Mars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what? yeah, exactly. So, um, we're, we're actually very, very picky about those, but by the same token, I, you know, they're there for a reason because people love that sort of chance to role play and, and, and approach a plot in so many different yeah, get ways. A little, Get a little day in the life stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Day in the life is excellent stuff. Yeah, yeah. And and you know, I think it works not to just keep saying, "Ah, oh, this is the thing I like." But like, you know, so what do you it, like? About it's, it's, yeah. It is an interesting. <laughs> you know, the other, the, the other the other thing we I was talking about recently on the show is the the Paragon and uh, whatever the other one is, Renegade system, okay. yeah. um, which are not not entirely mutually exclusive. You know, I mean, I have a character who's who's more Paragon, but he's got a bunch of Renegade in there as well. Or she, yep. I guess now. And uh, I mean, does that factor in at all to how you how you have to write? 
quests and, and sort of try to design things in such a way that is less good and evil and more sort of the MO of the character. Like it's, it's more of a, it's more of like how they operate and less the morality of what they're doing. At yeah. least that's how it feels to me. Yeah. I think, um, you know, Shepard has a very defined set of parameters um, for his range, like that he can go in, and so we try to keep 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 him within those parameters, sort of thing. Otherwise, he's not he's not going to be believable. You know, like if he can go completely, sort of, you know, Reaper. Colonel Clink in one yeah. way, sort of mm-hmm. thing. You know, Mwahaha or Gandhi in the other. You know, it's that that's not a believable character anymore, right? So, um, you know, one of the things we try to do is just say that you know Shepard is, and it's kind of I've mentioned this a couple of times, is you know Shepard he always ends up doing the right thing, but how he gets there is you know maybe questionable sometimes you know like he can he can go a little jack power on people right sure. and it's just like you're in my way i'm gonna i'm gonna take you out you know because the, the quickest way to finish this is to kill you sort of thing right so having that in there and, and i guess it's uh, it's more about uh the player's approach to solving the mission and necessarily not necessarily so much about the morality i think it was what you're getting at sort of sure. thing and it does definitely feel like it. but the fun thing is that there's, there are some times when you're just, you're, you, yeah, I'm a Paragon player, I'm a Paragon player, I'm going to do And then you come across the most annoying, you know, and it's just like, oh, I just want to shoot this guy and get him yeah. out of my way. And do I really, you know, that that was some of the fun stuff that we did where we just had people who was just like, just like I just want to kill this guy. I want him out of the way, but that's not a Paragon play to me. You know? Putting people on that sort of paradox or thing. It's kind of right. fun. Yeah. yeah. And, I mean, uh, there are, you also have a lot of situations in the game that these are, these are not reflected it statistically usually but there are a lot of cases where you can say different things uh, you can choose a different uh, option a different dialogue option but the thing he says is actually the same as another option and so it's almost more suggesting to the character I guess this is the tone he has in mind when he says it yeah. is that like an economy issue or is that like what, what's the thinking behind that was, that? that was an economy issue and um, and actually something that we've uh, you know when we talk about things that we've tried to fix from Mass Effect 2 is to try to avoid that as much as possible mm-hmm. um Partly to get behind some of the you know nuts and bolts. When we originally looked at the the new conversation wheel, it was new for us at the time. Anyway, uh, we said that we always wanted it to be balanced. So you always had your default response, and you'd always have a renegade and a paragon response with it. Uh, but there are instances where that's just not appropriate. It's just like uh, I can't think of anything renegade to say here. So I sort of have a renegade paraphrase, but it would actually link mm, to the same response right. from the NPC, mm. or even sometimes, which is even worse, which we tried to really avoid, but sometimes it came up where it was actually the same response from Shepard sort of thing, right? Um, and that's something that we've changed on on uh, Mass Effect 2 completely. Like, uh, we were always very careful that uh, if you make a specific Renegade or Paragon response, then Shepard will be different, and the line that uh, responds to it will, will likely be very different as well, sort of thing. Yeah. So, um, you know, but it was the first time through, so a lot of times, it, for us, it was just like, oh, wow, we've, you know, we've set this standard of balancing it and we have to stick with it, and then we kind of lightened up a bit on that for for Mass Effect Two. Yeah. yeah. Can you point to any kind of broad arcs like this? This, as far as I know, this is intended to be the second game in a trilogy, mm-hmm. right? Is that yeah? Yep. Uh, yeah we, so I mean, can you can you point to sort of broad themes of like if the first game was this, the second game is this, and theoretically the third game might be this? I don't mean in terms of plot points. But sure. Sure. Well, I think you know, um, in the uh, in the first game, uh, we were really talking about the struggle of humanity in general sort of thing right it was just sort of like this is humanity's new on the stage uh, and uh you know how how do we how do they fit into the whole galactic community sort of thing and we kind of introduced some themes that i think are carried for much more mass effect 2 such as uh what is the difference between organic and inorganic uh life you know is is an ai um not at life just because it's you know been built uh, or maybe if it gets advanced enough, does it then become its own, you know, sapient being? Sort yeah, of thing. So the more classic sci-fi questions. Yeah, more exactly. So, and I mean, and it, there's a bit of, I think there's a bit more of that. And we, we, we start to sort of approach that a bit in Mass Effect 1, but I think we've started to explore those themes a little bit more and, and some of the darker sides of that. You know, what, is, what does life mean? When, how do you define life? And uh, it's kind of interesting. You know, Shepard definitely goes down some darker paths in, in this one or has some darker choices to make. Yeah. Great. Well, I think we're getting the uh, time signal yeah. here. So. <laughs> Thanks a lot for taking the time. Really oh, I appreciate it. Yeah, it was you. a lot of fun. Thanks, guys. Thank Good you. luck on the game. Thank you. Video game. Rex. Shepard. Rex. Shepard. I've had enough of your snide insinuations. You son of a bitch!